one of the most successful human species ever. For 250,000 years, they dominated Europe, a continent ravaged by ice ages and stalked by wild animals. Then, 35,000 years ago, they faced the ultimate challenge. The arrival of another human species. This is the story of the last time two different species of human shared this planet. Only one of them would survive. It's first light. The daily routine has already begun. The hunters are a formidable team, a mother and a daughter, driven by the instinct to survive. Their kill will provide food and much more besides. Thirty-five thousand years ago, southern France was a cold and unforgiving place to live. A thousand miles away, an ice sheet grips northern Europe, bringing polar conditions to much of the continent. In winter, temperatures can plummet to 25 below, similar to northern Canada today. Herds of woolly mammoth roam the windswept grassland. The forests offer refuge for bison and red deer. And limestone caves provide shelter for the people of this valley. These are the Neanderthals the first human species to adapt to this harsh and frozen continent. Their lives are among the toughest ever endured by human beings, but they are well equipped for survival here. Their small clan places little stress on the environment. Close ties bind them together. Protection from the freezing cold comes from animal skins cleaned and worn as clothing. To prepare the skin, the mother first scrapes off fat and sinew with a sharp flint blade. She uses her teeth as a vice. Her face is designed to spread the stress evenly around her skull. Her teeth are worn for many years of use. There are only two women in the clan. An old man, three adult males, and a young boy make up the seven-strong family group.
This cave is the center of their world. Within its walls, they sleep, eat, butcher meat, and even defecate. The discarded waste that littered the floors of Neanderthal caves became buried and then, over time, fossilized. It has become priceless evidence that has revolutionized our vision of the Neanderthals. Far from the ape-like and brutish characters of popular myth, we now know they were a strong, intelligent, and highly adapted species. The latest scientific techniques have revealed incredible details about their lives. Fossilized feces can tell us what they ate. Teeth can tell us how they scraped animal hides to make clothing. Fractured and withered bones reveal how their lives were plagued by injury and disease. And even how some met violent and unexpected deaths. Two generations divide the old man and the young boy, but they have one thing in common. In this harsh climate, they are the most vulnerable. Childhood is the most dangerous time. Nearly half of the Neanderthal fossil record consists of children under the age of 11. Oh, Malcolm! At five years old, this boy has only just been weaned from his mother's breast. Thanks. Yet his brain is the size of a modern-day adult. His physical skills are advanced. just as well. In an environment like this, you either grow up quickly or you die. <sighs> For the oldest member of the clan, life is no less precarious. <sighs> He's 43 years old, but injury and exertion have broken his body, hastening old age. Already he's living on borrowed time. Four out of five Neanderthals never get to see their 40th birthday. of a man aged about 40 were unearthed in the Shanidar cave, Iraq, in 1957. Scars on his ankles and ridges on his kneecaps reveal he was already crippled with arthritis. He had 
multiple fractures to his upper right arm. Paralyzed and misshapen, it had withered to a fraction of its normal size. Here it lies alongside a normal, healthy bone. The lower half of the arm is completely missing, severed above the elbow by some traumatic event in his life. Close examination of his skull reveals the cause of these injuries. It's almost invisible to the naked eye, but the left side of his skull shows signs of a serious fracture. The subsequent brain damage would have paralyzed the right side of his body and may have blinded him in one eye. Done. For the old, there are few concessions in this brutal world. If he is to stay with the clan, he needs to pull his weight. Neanderthals are a territorial species. This clan's territory is around 27 square miles, the range of an average day's hunt. Some distance from the cave, the clan's three brothers have picked up the scent of prey. The oldest brother is the leader, the strongest and most experienced. He orchestrates the hunt. These deer are in their prime. Nutritionally, they're more valuable than old or sickly prey, but also much harder to catch. Neanderthal's world was much smaller than the one we know today. Arctic tundra in the north and vast stretches of desert and sea to the south restricted their range to Europe and Western Asia. Even at their peak, it's estimated that as few as 100,000 Neanderthals may have lived within this border. Bones and artifacts have been found as far south as Israel, in Uzbekistan and the Ukraine in the east, in Poland, Germany, and even in Wales in the north, to Portugal in the far west. But southwest France was one of the most densely populated regions, home to as many as 3,000 Neanderthals. The 
hunt has not been successful. Darkness has fallen and the men are stranded on the edge of their territory. If they are to survive a night away from their cave, they must make a fire. Neanderthals were not the first to use fire. It had been known to humans for over half a million years. But their skill in harnessing it is key to their survival in this frozen continent. Fire provides warmth, of course. At night, temperatures can fall by 10 degrees. But in the open, Fire is also their main means of protection. part of France. Neanderthals are not just the predators, they are also the prey. Next morning, the hunt begins again. This time, their target is neither deer nor bison. On the border that divides their territory from the next, the brothers have stumbled upon another kind of prey. One more precious to the long-term survival of their clan. The size of their caves and the debris unearthed within them suggest that Neanderthals lived in very small groups, perhaps no more than 25, and sometimes as small as eight. Small enough to avoid putting pressure on scarce resources, but too small to ensure the survival of the species without some interaction with other groups.
By kidnapping a second adult female, the clan has doubled its opportunities to breed and therefore its chances of survival. The fact that Neanderthals were territorial makes it likely they were male kin bonded, organized around fathers, brothers and sons. Yes, a child. Women were probably transient, moving from clan to clan. To have survived as long as they did, Neanderthals must have exchanged women. Some of these exchanges may have been voluntary. But in such a closed society, it's likely that some encounters were like this one, forcible and potentially violent. Men returned to the cave after three days hunting. It's the Jai Lao. Their catch is unexpected. Margo. Margo. dominant female, the newcomer poses a threat to her position in the clan. She must quickly assert her authority. This is likely to be a terrifying experience. Everything about this clan is alien to her. Their smell, their clothes, their hair. Even their language. Many scientists believed that Neanderthals did not possess language. They assumed that, like other primates, they communicated using only gestures and calls. Until quite recently, research on Neanderthal skulls supported this idea, suggesting that their mouth and throat were so different from ours that they probably couldn't speak as we do. But in 1983, a discovery at Kibara Cave in Israel turned this debate on its head. These three tiny fossils make up a bone called the hyoid. They sit in the throat, holding the muscles and flesh of the vocal mechanism in place. The Neanderthal hyoid is almost identical to ours and is the most compelling evidence yet that their throat was designed for speech. It may well have been more limited than ours, but it now seems certain that Neanderthals had a language of their own.
The lives of the Neanderthals are dominated by the need to secure food. At the age of 11, the youngest woman in the clan has not been hunting for long. Her prey is small, but it's fast, and she has to be skillful. decade or so will be her prime hunting years, assuming, of course, that she lives that long. The Neanderthal's world is a dangerous one. Almost all the adult fossils discovered so far reveal some kind of serious injury. Wild animals provide one threat. The treacherous landscape provides another. survive a few minutes. This rescue has a selfish motive. The clan need the new female too much to let her die. Without them, she stands little chance of survival. This interdependence has helped the Neanderthals to master their environment. But now the dominance of Europe is under threat. In the last few thousand years, a new species has arrived here. For the first time, these Neanderthals are not alone. Turn to the hunt. As Neanderthal spears were not designed for throwing, killing must be done at close quarters.
Driving the deer over a cliff makes it less likely that the men will injure themselves. A debilitating injury could be the difference between life and death, not just for the individual, but for the whole clan. is to carry the kill the six miles back to the cave. But Neanderthal bodies are powerhouses. They've evolved to take this kind of strain. The glaciers of Europe not only shape the landscape, but the features of the Neanderthals who lived here. Their bones grew strong in direct response to the stress they were subjected to. The walls of Neanderthal leg bones are particularly thick. Joints around the elbow, hip and knee are also enlarged. Shaped by the habitual pressure of living life as a Neanderthal, they also show signs of bowing. Seen in contrast to the modern leg beside it, Neanderthal bones are not just thick and bowed, they're much shorter than our own. Short, heavy bodies reduce the skin's surface area, helping to maintain a high body temperature. Even their noses evolved to cope with the extreme cold weather. Their nasal cavities are larger than our own and contain extra capillaries and mucus to warm and moisturize the air, preventing damage to fragile internal tissue. Of course. This combination of features makes Neanderthals the first human species specifically adapted to a cold climate. Faces may look ugly, but they are a triumph of evolutionary adaptation. Yeda. Now, the Neanderthals face a threat for which evolution has not prepared them. Physically, these strangers are not so well adapted to the bitter climate, but they have other advantages. 
They've evolved new ways of living together and new ways of thinking. They are Homo sapiens, known in Europe as the cro -Manuals. They're distantly related to the Neanderthals. One and a half million years ago, a human species called Homo erectus emerged from Africa into Asia and later into Europe. Over thousands of years, deserts, glaciers, and vast inland seas isolated the species. In the cold, harsh conditions of northern Europe, a new, cold-adapted species evolved, the Neanderthals. Meanwhile, in subtropical Africa, a warm adapted species evolved. 100,000 years ago, they expanded as far as the Middle East. 45,000 years ago, the weather turned warmer, opening up a route into Europe. And so, 10,000 years after they set out from the Middle East, the Cro-Magnons arrived in southern France. For now, their numbers are small. This advance party is scouting for new territory. These fertile river valleys in the south of France are perfect, except for one thing. This is the stronghold of the Neanderthals. The fresh kill is a welcome sight. To cope with the physical demands of their life, each adult Neanderthal needs to consume up to 4,000 calories per day. In the depths of winter, this can rise to as much as 7,000 calories, almost three times the amount we eat today. As he makes the first incision, the eldest brother stakes his claim. An adept butcher, he uses a razor-sharp flint to slice through the deer's belly. Today, meat makes up about 12% of the European diet. The Neanderthal diet was very different. By analyzing ground up pieces of bone, we can tell a lot about what Neanderthals ate. Extremely high levels of carbon and nitrogen confirm that meat made up the bulk of their diet. Fossilized feces, known as coprolites, support this view. Coprolites have recently been unearthed in Gibraltar. Believed to be Neanderthal, they consist almost entirely of the remnants of meat. The meat has been well digested, suggesting that Neanderthal's bodies evolved specifically to cope with such a diet. Scientists now estimate that 85% of a Neanderthal's food was meat, on a par with carnivores like wolves. No part of this animal will be wasted. The skin will be worked to make clothing. Sinew will be dried and used as rope. The skull will be smashed open to get at the brain, the tongue, and even the succulent eyeballs. Right. 
The old man is hungry. But his position within the pecking order means he has to wait his turn. Meanwhile, the youngest member of the clan has learned that it pays to be an opportunist. Inside the cave is a dumping ground where the younger brothers butcher the deer. They break its neck and sever its limbs. It's a messy job. Blood, gristle, and the remains of other carcasses cover the floor and walls. But better to do it here than outside, where the smell of fresh meat could attract predators. Like other carnivores, a special combination of enzymes in Neanderthal stomachs allows them to consume large quantities of raw meat. But cooked meat is more digestible and nutritionally less wasteful. The intense heat of the fire breaks down the protein and fat molecules, allowing them to be rapidly absorbed by the body. It's safer too. The heat kills off parasites and deadly bacteria. The Neanderthal's ability to cook gives them the edge over the other predators that share their world. communication, demonstrating loyalty, affection, and trust. Intimate contact of this kind is immensely pleasurable. The clan can spend up to four hours a day relaxing under each other's touch. self-sufficient unit. This unit has ensured their survival until now. have sustained the Neanderthals for thousands of years are about to become weaknesses. Ironically, they are so well adapted to this world that it's hard for them to cope with the pace of change now taking place. 
the small size of their clan makes them vulnerable. Limited language skills make it hard for them to seek alliances with others. And their self-sufficiency blinds them to the threat that is now closing in. Suddenly, two human species stand face to face. How will they react to each other? In this harsh world, is it possible for them to coexist? A fight for survival is about to begin. Nothing in this Neanderthal's life could have prepared him for this encounter. The stranger doesn't just look different. He thinks and acts in ways which are quite alien to a Neanderthal. He is a new species of humanity. A Homo sapien, known in Europe as a Cro-Magnon. Seeing is one thing. Comprehending is another. Und wir, 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 und, und wir, und, Sato, Sato. We can't know exactly how Neanderthals reacted to their first sight of Cro-Magnons. But coming from such a sheltered world, it may be that they simply did not understand the significance of what they saw. For now, what preoccupies the clan is the onset of winter. They are one of the smaller clans living in this part of France. The old man and the young boy, three adult men and three women are the entire family group. All of them will need to play their part if they're to survive the next few months.
This hazel branch will make an excellent spear. But the young female will soon be taking a break from hunting. She's almost eight months pregnant. The Neanderthal toolkit consisted of around six types of tool, all geared to more specific tasks than those of earlier humans. Hand axes, shaped to fit snugly in the palm of a hand, acted as a multi-purpose tool used to crush bones and cut wood. Side scrapers were used to prepare and soften animal skins. Triangular points were used as knives or could be hafted to make tips for spears. The Lavalwa blade was their greatest technological achievement. Some had cutting edges just one molecule thick, five times sharper than a surgeon's scalpel. Within the clan, tool making skills and knowledge are passed down from one generation to the next. There are subtle differences between the tools used by this clan and Neanderthals elsewhere in Europe. Proof that clans rarely interacted. The dominant female strengthens her spear in the flame. It's an effective weapon, but not a new one. It's been around for half a million years, even longer than the Neanderthals themselves. The isolated existence of clans had a direct effect on their development. Limited interaction meant there was little chance to exchange new ideas and techniques. The result was that Neanderthal tools changed little in 250,000 years. The dominant male uses tree resin to fix the point to the shaft of his spear and sinew to bind it. It's a sophisticated weapon capable of lacerating the thickest hide, but it's too heavy to throw very far and exposes him to the dangers of close quarter hunting. Were Neanderthals capable of innovation? Did they have the cognitive skills to develop new ways of doing things? Buried in the archaeological record is tantalizing evidence that they did. 35,000 years ago, a remarkable transformation took place. Neanderthal tool-making techniques began to change. As well as stone, they started to use antler, bone, and even teeth. For the first time, they began to make not just tools, but decorative items like jewelry. Some scientists believe that this is evidence of a revolution in their thinking. But it may be too convenient that this great leap forward coincided with the arrival of the Cro-Magnons.
the Neanderthals may simply have been copying Cro-Magnon techniques. Without ever grasping what these signs and symbols really meant. The Cro Magnons possessed a weapon more powerful than anything the Neanderthals had devised. A brain which, while no bigger than a Neanderthal's brain, was capable of new ways of thinking. Body paint and jewelry are just the outward manifestations of something far more profound. arrived. Red deer have migrated south in search of warmer weather. The balance between the food supply and the needs of the clan is delicate at the best of times. The arrival of the Cro-Magnons now threatens to tip the scales. Food has become even more scarce. Timmy, get the ball! Have Timma! Killing a mammoth is a dangerous undertaking. For these women, one of them heavily pregnant. The risk is too great. Instead, they turn to scavenging. Scavenging meat is not ideal. An animal that's been dead for some time can harbor dangerous bacteria. Fortunately, this animal has not been dead for long. The freezing water has helped to preserve the meat. The women will use fire to thaw it out. Soon, other scavengers will be on the scene. The women must take what they can, and quickly. day turns to night, temperatures plummet below zero. The men sleep within the confines of the cave, warmed by the heat from two fires. <laughs> 